Uh, there are still some some people probably coming in, but uh, I think we can we can begin to sort of go through the, the sort of front matter, if you like, of the the talk. So uh, today's talk is uh, is a talk from Mermish on uh, extreme compression of LSTM models. Um, I, won't, I won't say any more about that because uh, uh, obviously Mermish is going to tell us all about that. Um, Obviously, uh, Tiny Mel Talks are sponsored, uh, and we have a strategic partner, an RMR strategic partner. Um, they provide uh, a great deal of support to, to what happens. We also have uh, additional uh, sponsors in Deep Light, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, Kixo, Reality AI, and Syncense. So, and you'll hear a little bit more about those at the end. Um, Uh, the next tiny ML talks are, are from Deep Light uh, and Imagimob, Eshan Saburi and Alexander Samuelson. That's next Tuesday. If you uh, are interested, it'll be at this time. So uh, please feel free to join and, and hear from what they have to say. Um, just a quick word about the UK committee. There's uh, Alessandro from ARM. Myself, I'm Dominic Binks, I'm the VP of Technology at Audio Analytic. Uh, Gianmarco, who also from ARM, uh, and my colleague Neil from uh, also from Audio Analytic. We've scheduled the next meeting for the Tiny Mel uh, UK group for the 26th of January. I have every anticipation that it isn't going to be anything other than virtual. Um, and if you want to contact us, if you've got any um, questions or thoughts or suggestions, please feel free to uh, mail us at meetupsuk at tinymail.org and we'll be able to respond to you. Um, Umesh uh, is a deep learning researcher at Sambanova Systems, and prior to that, he worked at ARM, Research, AMD, Texas Instruments, and Broadcom. And his research has been based around this whole area of reducing the size of models to fit on smaller and smaller devices, something that's key for, for TinyML. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to you, Umesh. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> and it's good to be here. Good afternoon to everyone uh, joining in. So, the Title of my talk today is going to be a technique for extreme compression of LSTM models using additive structured matrices. So this work was done while I was at ARMS ML Research Lab with my collaborators at the lab. So the overall aim of this project was to explore structures that can help us build extremely small RNNs or LSTM models. In part, this was sort of inspired from how the vision community evolved or or, or to be more specific, how embedded vision models evolved with, with the invention of these structures that allowed you to create very small embedded vision models that fit in a few megabyte budget, or even sometimes in a few hundred kilobyte budget. Things like the fire module, squeeze net, and then, and then the evolution to mobile net, et cetera. Specifically wanted to see if we can be a little brave and target compression factors of 25X or more. So all of the work that I'll be talking about today is builds on our prior work on structured matrices. And I, in the first few slides, I'll just introduce that work before I dive deeper into the current project. So let us start by understanding what a structured matrix is. So a structured matrix is any matrix that can be expressed using fewer parameters than what would have been ideally required to express that matrix. So if your matrix is of dimension n cross n, you generally require n squared number of parameters to describe it. Uh, now let us look at on the right hand side of the screen where you have the low rank matrix factorization. Here we are expressing a matrix V using two smaller matrices W and H. And the structure that we have defined is that V is equal to W into H. Now because we have a fixed structure of gener generation of V, now we can actually express V using fewer number of parameters by only storing W and H. An extreme example of that is going to be on the left where you see the circular matrix. In a circular matrix, each row of the matrix is basically the left shift of the previous row. So now a matrix that should ideally require n squared number of parameters to express itself only requires n number of parameters because all you need to know is one row of the matrix and you can left shift that, mat uh, left shift that row to generate the entire matrix. One particular structured matrix that I'll be talking a lot about in this presentation is going to be Kronecker product. A lot of our work uh, builds on top of Kronecker product and I'll get into the details why, but the techniques discussed in this paper, uh, eventually we show that the techniques discussed in this paper can be applied to other uh, structured matrices also. So 
what is a Kronecker product? A Kronecker product of two smaller matrices gives you a larger matrix. If A and B are each of size M cross N and P cross Q, the Kronecker product of A and B would give you a matrix of size MP cross NQ. So instead of M and PQ number of parameters required to store the larger matrix, now you can express that larger matrix using only M and plus PQ number of parameters. And the way Kronecker product does this is that it defines a larger matrix using this fixed structure of generation. So you take the scalar value A11 from A, you scale the matrix B and stick it in the top left corner. And similarly, you generate the other, other quadrants of the larger matrix. If, if this wasn't example, if this wasn't very clear, hopefully this walkthrough would make it clear as to how Kronecker products work. So again, you have a matrix C being expressed as a Kronecker product of two smaller matrices. Uh, the way it works like is that you take one from A, that is the first element from A, you scale B and stick in the top left corner. You take two from A, scale B, stick in the top right corner. Similarly, you create the bottom left in the bottom right corner. So this way of generation, the, the, the fixed structure allows you to express a matrix that would have ideally required 16 parameters to be expressed only using eight parameters, four from A and four from B, giving you 2x compression. And then as the matrix C becomes larger and larger, the amount of compression also becomes bigger and, and bigger. So we had already explored uh, the usage of chronic products for neural network compression. And, and I don't go into the details about this paper, but this is the highlights of, of that work. We, we were able to get, get large compression factors. We were doing better than other traditional compression technologies like pruning and Luran matrix factorization, getting good inference runtime speed ups, and then also being orthogonal to quantization. But what we struggled was to sort of make this uh, technique more widespread, or in a sense, uh, apply it to a more wide range of applications or even bigger applications. And what we realize at this point is that a lot of structured matrix compression techniques, while extremely promising, uh, as you can see, 16 to 38 X compression are only uh, useful for certain niche applications. They generally don't, don't generalize well. And that is going to be, that, that makes these techniques not being adopted widespread, right? A technique like pruning can be applied to any network, making it very usable and sort of allowing it to create tools that people can use out of the box. If something is more niche, doing that is going to be difficult. So the question that this project tried to answer was that, why aren't structured matrices more widespread uh, in terms of uh, the amount of, the number of applications that they can compress and what can be done to fix that? To understand that, we need to understand how structured matrices work during back propagation. And what we realize is that the, the ability that allows a structured matrix to achieve large compression, this is generation of larger matrix using a fixed structure is also something that limits its expressibility. So suppose during back propagation, we realize that the matrix C and particularly this value in matrix C needs to go from two to four to get to the minima that we want. Now, remember C is generated from A and B. So if you want to change something in, in, in C, you need to change uh, values in A and B to get to that point. Now this value two in C was generated by taking two from A and multiplying that with one in B and creating that quadrant. So if you want that value to change from two to four, what you do is you change this value from two to four. What that means is that all these four values change. The second way of doing this is you change this value from one to two. Remember that value two was generated by taking this value one, multiplying by two in A and creating that value. So if you change that value to, from one to two, you change that value from two to four. But again, all these four values also change. So what you're saying is that the fixed structure doesn't allow you to get to the minima that you want. And, and as the matrices become bigger and bigger, the number of uh, values that are changed when you change one single value in A and B increases. So instead of getting to the minima, uh, you can imagine you're just dancing around that minima, never getting to the accuracy that you want. Now for certain applications, these minimas can be quite flat and this might work out, but it, it definitely is not true for all applications or generally applicable. And to us, that was the reason, at least to us, the intuition was that might be the reason why these structured matrices don't generalize to other applications. Is this problem with not having certain parameters who can express themselves freely or rather away from the fixed structure that we have created. So the question becomes, how do we fix this? We, we want this nice structure properties that uh, structured matrices have because that gives us these large compression factors. 
but we also want certain par parameters to diverge from this fixed structure. So, so what do we do to fix that? And the simple solution that we came up with is that why don't we just add an extremely sparse additive matrix on top of the structured matrix? So now, instead of each weight matrix being expressed as uh, compressed uh, in, in the compressed format using structured matrices, you now express it as the using the using the sum of two matrices. One is compressed using structured matrices, and one is compressed using sparsity. And then because the sparsity of the matrix is going to be extremely large, we are targeting around 97, 98% sparsity. The overall storage required to store a weight matrix is going to be significantly less, right? Chronicle products already is giving you 30, 40X compression. And if that matrix that is going to be added is going to be 95%, 96% sparse, it, it's going to be a large compression factor that you are getting. And what that allows us to do also is that we allow certain parameters that were not able to move around freely to express themselves more freely by uh, populating those corresponding locations in the additive matrix as being non-zero. So overall, we, we sort of call this new compression technology as dope structured matrices, which in this case is going to be dope Kronecker product. And then this is sort of a, a this notation was adopted because we see doping being very useful in the semiconductor industry where certain excitations allow you to create the electronics world that we see around us. So at this point we thought, okay, we, we might have the intuition or the tools to build a structured matrix compression tool techniques uh, that would generalize to more applications. But the question remained, how do we identify locations that uh, need more expressibility? In this example that we saw, we, we sort of knew beforehand that this value needs to go from two to four. But during neural network training, how do we know that? <clears throat> and for that, we thought maybe we can just use back propagation to help us do that. So the idea here was that the sparse additive matrix starts off being dense, that is with no, non, with no zero values in it. And as training progresses, you prune most of the values away from the sparse matrix, creating a very, uh, creating the sparsity required, getting the sparsity requirements that we want. And the hope is that back propagation and then sort of these training signals would have eventually helped us figure out what values in this, these sparse matrix need to be non-zero to achieve the good accuracy that we want, right? And we, we hope that this technique would work out for us and allow us to train these large compressed networks using structured matrices. So at this point, we sort of thought, okay, it might be a good idea to try out this exercise on a large NLP application. So we took a language model application, which has which had two LSTM layers. The total size of the application after these LSTM layers turned out to be of around 25 MB, I think. And then the baseline perplexity is was around 82. So for language models, the notion of accuracy is measured using perplexity. And in case of perplexity, the lower value is better. So you, you need to sort of keep that in mind as you see the results along uh, in, in subsequent slides. So we, we took that NLP application and compressed it using vanilla chronicle product and using dope chronicle product. Remember in vanilla chronicle product compression, this MSP matrix does not exist. There is no matrix supporting the chronicle product structure. And using vanilla chronicle product compression, we got 338x compression, which is an insanely large value. But we also saw a huge loss in accuracy, right? Your perplexity is decreasing from 82 to 104, which is around what, 20% uh, loss in accuracy or maybe 30%. And then what that means is that you're basically rendered the application useless. Yes, you are getting a large compression factor, but you're losing so much of the uh, accuracy that you have rendered the application useless. Again, sort of hitting back to the point that for perplexity, lower values is better. So 82 is better than 104. Now we added 1% more parameter into the sparse matrix. So now we are doping on top of the, of the chronicle product matrix. And because you're adding 1% more parameter, uh, the amount of compression factor decreases, right? You're, 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 you are using more parameters. So the amount of compression with respect to the baseline is going to decrease. So now your compression factor decreased from 338X to 100X. And at this point, you would have imagined that in an ideal scenario, if, if dope chronicle products work, then the, the amount of accuracy gains that you get should be significant. But what you're seeing is that the accuracy is actually lost. We are worse off than the vanilla chronicle product compression. So doping or adding more parameters did not actually work. So at this point, we were slightly confused. Was our intuition wrong or was there something wrong with the training methodology that 
uh, that led to this poor accuracy after doping. So the next step in the project became understanding what was going wrong before we came to a hard conclusion that uh, this, uh, this methodology of training does not work or this compression technology does not work. Because right now at this point, we didn't know what was the reason was failing. So to collect that evidence, evidence, we started looking at the training curves. What you see here on the screen is the training perplexity uh, plotted against the number of epochs as the training progressed. And on the right hand side, you see sparsity being, pro, uh, being uh, <clears throat> plotted against training epochs as the training progress. Remember this matrix that you see on the screen, which is completely dark right now is dense initially. And we are hoping that back propagation eventually figures out what values are unimportant in that matrix. And you just turn those values to zero and create a sparse matrix, right? So that is why sparsity increases over time. You're annealing the amount of sparsity over time. Now, what we observe is that initially during training, we are actually doing good. So again, this is training perplexity, lower values better, and we are getting uh, better and better uh, at learning the data distributions over time. But when we hit the required amount of sparsity, to enable large compression factors, uh, the training perplexity increases again. So your accuracy is getting significantly worse than what you would have imagined. And then we never recovered back. So this was something that came as a shock to us. Basically, we wanted the sparse matrix to be a support to the chronic product matrix. If you look back at the, at the initial figures that I supported, we wanted that value in two, value two in C to go from two to four. And we were hoping that this sparse matrix figures out what locations in the chronic product structure need these additional degrees of freedom and then sort of just populate them to a non-zero value. But what is actually happening is during training, um, the minima that was being learned was too reliant on the dense matrix. And when you take away all of the parameters of the dense matrix to get to the required amount of uh, compression, you just lose the minima and actually never come back. So instead of the sparse matrix be playing a supporting role to the chronic product matrix, now it has started playing to, it has started to dominate the minima. And this was exactly opposite to what we wanted. So the question becomes, what do we do? So the problem was uh, <clears throat> the, the, this matrix being playing the dominant part and we wanted to sort of uh, stop that from happening. Now we thought a bit more about the problem and we realized the reason this was happening was actually obvious and right in front of us. Things generally become sort of obvious in retrospective and this is what had happened. If you look at what was happening is that the weight matrices in a neural network being replaced, were being replaced by the chronic product matrices and the dense matrix, which was going to eventually turn sparse. Now these chronic product matrices uh, are, are always present in this compressed notations. Right, while the dense matrix is in its uncompressed format and is eventually you turn it in sparse, but initially it has far more number of parameters than the chronic product matrices. To be more specific, the chronic product matrices for the application that we saw earlier had around 10,000 parameters, and the dense matrix had around 4 million parameters. So during back propagation, what was happening is that this dense matrix was getting updated uh, more number of times than the chronic product matrices. And our suspicion was that because the dense spread matrix was getting updated for a larger number, for, for, for more number of times, uh, the minima was getting too reliant on, on the, the dense matrix. And when you pruned away most of the parameters, you were losing it. So now that we understood the problem a bit more, we, were, we started thinking about how to fix that. And that's when we sort of fall, fell, fell back on some classical literature on how to fix this in, in machine learning. So again, we wanted to reduce the dominance of the dense matrix in the initial phase of training. And the way we did that is to sort of scale the dense matrix using a scalar parameter. And we try to sort of subdue that scalar parameter so that overall effect of that would be that the dense matrix is playing a smaller role because of the extremely small values that will be learning. On top of that, we, we tried out also something called as the block coordinate descent training technique. In block coordinate descent training technique, you end up blocking gradients to an entire uh, structure that you might want. So the idea here was that because the gradient updates to the dense matrix are significant, why not just block gradient updates to the dense structure so that we are creating a more level ground so for, for the chronic products to learn at the same pace as the dense matrix. 
and we thought maybe this will help us and and we sort of got to work and and applied these training techniques to the uh, application that we saw earlier compressed using dope cranker product and when we started seeing good results and those are indicated here uh, yeah apologies i think i think the access is got 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 cut but what you see again here is the training perplexity versus epoch so training perplexity access is on the left hand side the one from 0 to 180 this has been plotted against the number of epochs as the training increases uh, as the number of epochs in training increases or as the training progresses and we are simultaneously plotting again sparsity which you see on the right axis here uh, as a function of training epochs so how much is the dense matrix getting sparse over time as the training progresses we are looking at uh, five different curves curve number 1 in blue is the or vanilla dope cranker product the way we trained earlier which did not give us good results 2a 2b 2a plus bcd and 2b plus bcd are all these techniques and their various combinations and what we see is that the train increase in training accuracy now is significantly smaller than what was earlier compare this with the blue curve where we are losing a lot of the accuracy as things became more sparse but now we are we have started to manage the dominance of the dense matrix as things are getting more sparse and overall that also helped us uh, in terms of perplexity scores also our baseline perplexity score was 82 after chronic upper compression of around 338 x was around 104 and and using all of these training techniques uh, we are able to bring down the perplexity score at 100 x compression factor to around 100 remember uh, earlier we were at 138 now we are at 100 so we have already made significant progress but we are still seeing this little bump right so the next question that we asked ourselves is that can we make this better can we actually bring that bump down even further and what would happen in terms of uh, perplexity if we bring that bump even down further and the hope there was that maybe the the, the test accuracy becomes even better and then sort of at that point we will start scaling the experiments to more number of applications and then see what was happening so to understand what more could have been done we took a step back and then sort of viewed things from a top down approach we were started viewing things from how uh, the output feature vectors are created and then started to starting to understand what does co matrix adaptation mean uh, or the dominance of msp mean from an output feature vector so the next two three slides are going to be slightly more mathematics mathematical and technical uh, and then i'll try to walk through them slowly uh, so during output feature vector creation what happens is that in an lstm layer you have an input feature vector coming in that passes through the weights of a neural network to create your output feature vector o now in our case the weights of the neural network are actually sum of two weights right one is a weight matrix that is compressed using kronecker products and another is a weight matrix compressed using sp the, the sparse dense matrix which eventually turns sparse so basically what that means is that after compression uh and and during uh, out of output feature vector creation the the output feature vector is the sum of output features coming from the kronecker product matrix and the dense matrix that is the output feature vector is created by multiplying the input with the kronecker product matrix that would be the uh, m cron matrix here and the output feature vector created by multiplying the uh, sparse matrix with the input vector again that would be the msp into ii matrix so basically uh, if i look at each row in your output feature vector each row in an out output feature vector is the sum of ki where ki is the ith row of the output feature vector vector of m cron into i and si where si is the ith row of the output feature vector of msp into i so hopefully at this point things are slightly settling down and and these notations are clear again oi is the ith output feature vector uh, ith row of the output feature vector and the ith row of the output feature vector is created by summing up the ith row of the output feature vector created by multiplying n cron with i which is ki and the ith uh, row of the output feature vector created by multiplying msp with i that is si so now let's think about it, it from what is happening during neural network training now si is initially 
the, the sparse matrix is initially dense. So both Ki and Si are equally strong, right? They both co contribute equally to your output feature vector. So if Oi is equal to Ki plus Si, and Si is initially dense and contributing equally uh, to the output feature vector, as these dense matrix becomes sparse and sparse, the SI neuron is becoming weaker and weaker, weaker. The signal from the SI neuron is becoming weaker, basically. So what is happening is that KI was used to having SI to help it support to get to a particular output feature vector value that we wanted. That would be good for the accuracy. But over time, uh, it, it sort of, because SI became weaker, you, you sort of are losing capacity. And KI, which was earlier learning to coexist with SI now has to suddenly relearn it uh, uh, to live in a in a world where SI does not exist or SI is weaker. So this this is basically what is happening from a core matrix adaptation point of view uh, at the output feature neuron level. And then this sort of understanding of what was happening was similar to what was happening between core matrix adaptation or core matrix or core neuron adaptation uh, that was being proposed. And then in the neural network literature. So, this, so there was some sort of some, some parallels that was happening here. Now, the way co-matrix adaptation was solved in neural network literature was using a regularization technique called dropout. So we just adopted that dropout technique and applied it at this row level so that, uh, so that we could get the goodness of dropout uh, and sort of help us regularize this behavior. So again, uh, to sort of take things slowly, what was happening was that Ki and Si were learning to co-adapt with each other. Ki, which is the ith neuron, output neuron from the uh, matrix vector multiplications of the chronicle product matrix and the input, and Si, which is the ith output neuron of the uh, matrix vector product of the sparse matrix and the input vector. Both of these neurons are combining to, to create the output neuron, and both of these neurons are learning to co-adapt with each other. Ki was getting used to SI and SI was getting used to Ki, but eventually SI is going to get weaker. So the idea became is that we will take inspiration from dropout and create training scenarios during which Ki learns to adapt or learns to behave on its own without having SI uh, to support itself. And then the way you do it in neural network is to sample things from Bernoulli distribution and you just do an element wise multiplication with that sampled value. Remember Bernoulli distribution gives you a value of zero or one based on a certain probability value. So what eventually happens is that uh, based on what B1 and B2 are sampled to be, the output feature neurons are either entirely Ki, Si or Ki plus Ai. Apologies, all these uh, subscripts somehow are not getting caught up in the equations and presentation mode. Uh, but the idea here is that when B1, when B2 is zero, so basically you are mimicking a scenario when SI is not present and then B1 is one, uh, the output feature neurons are entirely driven by Ki. And if the loss at that point is significantly higher, the back propagation can, equations can go to chronicle product matrices and say, hey, pick up the slack and then sort of learn features that allow you to get a good accuracy. Right, and then when both B1 and B2 are one, then basically OI turns out to be Ki and plus SI. And when both B1 and B2 are zero, then then OI value is going to be zero. What that means is that um, uh, <clears throat> you are now doing regular dropout, which is a common regularization technique for neural networks. And then the, by by adjusting the probability values, you can adjust how much, how frequently do you see these scenarios? So you ideally would want to ensure that the scenario one that you see on top where OI is equal to KI is more uh, happening more frequently than all other scenarios at the bottom because eventually SI is going to be pruned away and that weaker signal is going to get weaker. So we, we, thought, we thought, okay, this, this made sense at an intuitive level that this should work. And we call this new sort of regularization scheme as co-matrix regularization. So at this point, our next task became trying to understand whether CMR is actually giving you more value than all of the other uh, uh, regularization schemes that we saw. Remember, 2A plus BCD and 2B plus BCD in our previous graphs were giving us a significant value. And what we saw was that, yes, we were getting a value. So the, the previous regularization schemes which exist in the literature that we tried allowed us to get to here. We had a good training curve where the bump in accuracy as sparsity increased is no longer as big as what it used to be. But with CMR, we were able to even bring down this curve further down and the bump is almost non-existent. There is still a bump, 
I agree, but it's not as prominent as any of the other curves. And I, I believe this perm would always exist because we are going from a hundred percent non hundred percent or basically a dense matrix to almost a 97, 98% sparse matrix. So there is always going to be slight loss in capacity. And then there's generally a loss in capacity that comes from compressing a neural network. And, and, and this better training curves also actually translated into better uh, overall scores after compression in terms of test perplexity. So again, after vanilla chronicle product compression, we were at 104 perplexity points, our baseline was 82. After doing no regularization, allowing the MSP to dominate over, over training epochs, our training perplexity was around, uh, one, uh, our test perplexity was around 138. Uh, after doing all of these fixes using different regularization schemes, the perplexity now boiled down to around 101. And then after doing CMR, the new regression scheme that we proposed, the perplexity is down to 95. So at this point, we thought that, yes, we think we have a good way of training dope chronic product structured matrices, uh, a training technique that allow, might, might allow us to generalize these techniques to larger applications and a broad array of applications. So we thought it would be, it is a good time to sort of take, take off these training wheels and see how this compression technique paired with other compression techniques that existed uh, or used popularly uh, by practitioners in this domain, and also how do they fare against previous state of the art. Um, and can I just, just, just ask a couple of questions? <clears throat> um, yeah, sure. Um, I think you said the application was a, a language model, is that correct? Yes, yes. Um, what kind of data was used for training? Uh, so this was the uh, PTB data set. So it's a popular data set used for training language models. It wasn't as big as the Wikitex data set, um, but it, it's still something that people have used. Um, okay, thank you. And the other question was, um, could, could you give some explanation as to how you were determining how the sparsity was changing throughout the epochs? Because it looks like a nice smooth curve. Was it as really as smooth as that? What, what was controlling that sparsity change? Uh, sorry, okay, yeah. So, so Controlling the sparsity is something that, uh, I mean, out, you, you can do that out of the box using tools provided by TensorFlow. Uh, so if you, if you, um, so th if you remember the paper to, to prune or not to prune, which was by uh, Google, uh, I think this was Suyog Gupta and all, uh, they, they provided a way to control sparsity over time, sort of annealing sparsity slowly uh, over time as training progressed it. And then they provided those tools and techniques for sparsity within the TensorFlow framework. So we just used those tools out of the box. Uh, there's another really interesting question just popped up. I'm so, I'm, it, that's a, someone's very, uh, um, Tendi has said that there was a great um, presentation, but um, the really interesting question is, um, what motivated you in the first place to look at chronic product matrices? Right, so this sort of boils down our initial work on chronic products. So as I said, this was sort of follow-up work on chronic products. So initially we were looking at these structured matrices. Uh, and as in the introduction, I sort of said that structured matrices have these beautiful properties that you can generate a larger matrix using these fewer parameters, right? You're almost learning how to generate a larger matrix using this uh, scheme or generation scheme that is set by the fixed structure. So we evaluated different structured matrices. And what we realized is that chronic products I mean, all of these structured matrices worked in their niche domains. Kronecker products seem to be more generalizable in our experiments. Again, this is empirical evidence. And the second thing was with Kronecker product matrices, we were able to get a significant inference runtime on today's generation of CPUs. So a lot of other structured matrices like uh, say circular matrices sometimes require you to have um, accelerators or specialized hardware, at least looking at the literature, the only way they were getting speed up over baseline was to have specialized hardware. And with chronic product matrices, if you follow the right methodology, and that was our first paper on chronic products, if you follow the right methodology, you, you are able to get inference speed up on CPUs out of the box using only matrix multiplication. So no specialized way of doing uh, neural networks. And to us, that was an important property. Uh, a tool, a compression tool is only useful if it could be easily widely adopted, right? That is why pruning is, is so useful. After a certain amount of sparsity, we could use sparse matrix multiplication uh, fairly efficiently and then get out of the box speed up. So that was the reason we chose chronic products over other compression techniques. A, better accuracy, and if not better accuracy, then ease of use in terms of on, on current generation of CPUs. 
I think, I think that's a really interesting point. I mean, there are people obviously doing hardware accelerators and they have their own, you know, they, they do often a, a targeted very specific things, but there's still a big use of, uh, of ML techniques on just stock hardware doing just the stock thing. So yeah, I think that's a really valid point. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, and uh, okay, so uh, as I said, at, at this point, we were fairly convinced that this is how we should train dope chronicler products or any dope structured matrix. And we want, sort of wanted to take away our training wheels and then focus on how do we compress neural networks using dope chronicler product. Uh, and then sort of compare with previous state of the art and other traditional compression techniques that people use. So we, we did that, we took the NLP applications that, uh, the NLP application that I talked about previously, we, we compressed this using new, this new compression technique. And then this time to compression factors that are more uh, useful. When I say useful, after compression, you're getting an accuracy that is close to baseline so that uh, you can reuse this new application after compression. And we started looking at what the curves look like. So we plotted perplexity score, which you see on the y-axis here with compression factor, which you see on the x-axis here. And <clears throat> what we observed is that dope Kronecker product, uh, so basically if you're plotting perplexity score with compression factor, and in case of perplexity score, the lower value is better, any compression tool or a method or a technique, whatever you want to call it, that exists in the bottom right corner is better because that is giving you the maximum accuracy at the largest amount of compression. And then what you see is that dope Kronecker product outperformed all of these other compression tools and technologies by a large factor. As you can see, we are getting two and a half X more compression than previous state of the art and three or 4% or three or four more perplexity points than a prune baseline. So, and then we went ahead and applied this compression technique to some other applications and, and we saw some good results also. The, the second technique that thing that we were curious about was that whether this idea of doping co-matrix adaptation and co-matrix row regularization is that applicable only to structured matrix? Is that applicable only to Kronecker product, or could you apply it to other structured matrices? Because remember, that was the larger scope of the project. How do we generalize structured matrices in general? And, and we were curious about that question. And and what the what we realized is that the answer was yes. That if we apply doping CMA and CMR, we actually improve other structured matrices also. So here you see low rank matrix factorization. This was the structured matrix that we discussed at the second or third slide of this presentation on the right hand side where the larger matrix was created using product of two smaller matrices. So we take the, again, the same neural network application. We, we compress it uh, using low rank matrix factorization by a factor of 20 X. <clears throat> and then we, we get to a, a value of 103.4 perplexity score, which is significantly lower than the actual baseline. And when we use doped LMF and then sort of compress it to the same compression factor, we are significantly better than vanilla structure matrices. For another structure, we observe something similar. So basically what we sort of proved is that doping CMA, CMR can be applied to other structured matrices. Uh, the, the full blown paper of all of this work is currently under review, but the, the smaller version of this paper could be found of archive and then under the title of uh, compressing language models using two chronic products. And then once since the review period of the conference is over, we hope to bring out the fuller uh, context out of the full paper also with more applications, more experiments, sort of tying down the reticulated details of what makes chronic products work, what makes doping work, and then the science behind it. So I, I guess the last thing that I want to talk about was, I, I talked a lot about uh, the goodness of structured matrices and why, why they work. But uh, we, we also realized during uh, the, the, this, this entire uh, experiments and in this entire work that there are also significant limitations. One is that structured matrices along with these dense matrix that eventually become sparse, you're effectively doubling the neural network size during training, right? What that meant is that if you're training it on GPU because you're so memory bound generally for a large application, especially to for an NLP application, and then because you have this kernel to kernel based execution where each matrix multiplication happens on a kernel by kernel basis. By doubling the size of the network and by increasing the number of kernel call executions, your training time becomes significantly longer. In fact, sometimes you are seeing training times of increase of 5X or, or 6X. And then that was a huge limitation. So something that takes two days to train would not take 10 days to train. So basically you are very limited 
by your training resources. We also realize that everything is sensitive to hyperparameter tuning, but I mean, in our experience, these dope structured matrices are extra sensitive to hyperparameter tuning. So that coupled the long training time coupled with extra sensitivity to hyperparameter tuning meant that finding good points was always very difficult for us. It, it became a, a long and a hard ordeal. The second thing that sort of happened was this emergence of auto ML pipelines. People now generally want an out of the box experience. They just want to enable, uh, do, they want to see neural network compression as a tool that works as is, right? And auto MLs were getting very, auto ML pipelines were getting very good at that. You feed in your data, you feed in a superstructure, and that's all that you have to do uh, to get a compressed neural network. It would figure out how much to prune in each layer. It will figure out how much to quantize each layer. If you want sub 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 byte quantization, you can get that. If you want binary ternary quantization, you can get that. So all of these goodness uh, with with auto ML pipeline, you really got these very 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 compressed structures, uh, and it was unclear how structured matrices would fit into this auto ML pipeline, and whether uh, the 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 things that were invented after out of out auto ML, whether uh, structured matrices would be able to compete with them. And, and remember, once you have this auto ML pipeline, you have the optimized uh, weight matrix coming out. You further do k-means, things like k-means clustering or other optimizations uh, to, to sort of do uh, compression on top of an already compressed network. So you're already getting, I mean, the entire community was already moving to a scenario where the networks were getting highly compressed because of all these optimizations that people have been doing across stack and sort of fusing them together. And, and it was hard to see whether uh, well, chronicle products are going doing or a dope structure matrix are doing well in compression isolation, but when you combine them with all of these other techniques, uh, it was hard to see a uh, sort of a possible gain that they might have provided. So, so that was basically the end of my uh, research in that domain before I, I moved on. And that is also the end of the presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I can take more questions if they are available. Yeah, yeah, there are a few, Amish. Um, one interesting question, uh, how did you decide you know, where to size, how to size those Chronicle products from, from what you were starting with? Was there some kind of rule of thumb you used to start with or did you discover it or did you just kind of guess? Yeah, a, a great question. So just like in an AutoML pipeline, you require a superstructure that you specify that find the best amongst, amongst the superstructure. The way that the, it's a similar way with Chronicle products. Again, it sort of ties back to the first paper that we had on Chronicle products. So we, we take the superstructure, which would be the baseline app application, right? So again, you have to train a baseline application to a certain accuracy level, which you're comfortable with, and then start from that. That baseline application would define the structure, overall structure of the neural network. And then Chronicle products could be used to decompose those structures into smaller things that we want. And then the first paper talks about how do you do that decomposition? How do you find the sizes of the Chronicle products to get to the same structure that your baseline was creating? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, qu quick question. Can you use more than two matrices, two matrices in, the, in the product? So could you use say three, obviously, or N perhaps? Is that possible? Does it help? Is it worse? Is it better? Uh, that's a great question. Yes, you can potentially use more than two matrices. So what we observed, and again, sort of the methodology was tied down in the first paper. What we observed is that as you increase the number of Kronecker products, uh, matrices to create the larger matrix. So A, you can use that, right? So suppose your matrix is of size N cross N, the maximum number of Kronecker product matrices that you can use is log two of N. Right. So if you have a 1024 cross 1024 matrices, you can actually use 10 2 cross 2 matrices to create that 1024 cross 1024 matrices. And then you get phenomenal compression capabilities after that. But you also see something the issue of vanishing gradient. And then the first you go down into the technical details as to why you see vanishing gradient as you increase the number of chronic product matrices. So that limits the number of chronic product matrices that you can use. Even after that, you could probably use three, four, or five number of Kronecker product matrices. You don't really have to use log two of n. And that, that is where our philosophy of building something that can run on existing CPUs came into picture. When you have only, when you're only using two number of Kronecker product matrices, um, you using linear algebra tricks 
you can actually do inference without expanding those Kronecker product matrices into the larger matrix. Remember, if you expand that Kronecker product matrix into the larger matrix using that structure that we talked about, you're not really gaining a lot in terms of, uh, yes, you're gaining storage capabilities, but then your, your, your matrices are going to explode in your caches. So that is going to lead to poor performances. But if your number of Kronecker products are restricted to two, then using linear algebra tricks, which, and these tricks are known, right? It's not something that I invented. You can actually do inference on Kronecker product compressed matrices without expanding them using only two simple matrix multiplication calls on, on two smaller matrices. So sort of to cut the long story short, you use two matrices because uh, to reduce the vanishing gradient issue and also to get out of the box performance in terms of inference. That's great, thank you. <clears throat> uh... Just a couple of quick questions on on the results. Just just to confirm, I'm assuming all the results were conducted on the same data set for the results slide. There was all the the models were all trained yeah. on the same data set. Yeah, yeah. Um, and could could you also just just go a little bit um, back at, at the point where you had the perplexity rising again? This is in, essentially the, 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 the yeah this slide where you see. Um, do, do you do you know why the the perplexity increased at that point? Is, I think I think you did go into this a little bit, but could just just go over it again. Uh, so for the last curve, or in general, why the perplexity? In in, in general, and particularly probably in the simplest case, because that's probably the easiest one to to understand. Yeah, sure. Okay. So again, this this comes down to sorry. This slide, right? Uh, as I said. The, the, the way we wanted is that we wanted the dense matrix to support the Kronecker product matrix, right? But the matrix is dense initially, right? And then as the matrix was being turning sparse, uh, the, the perplexity increased. So the minima was getting too reliant on the dense matrix. And the reason, reason for that was because of this issue. Because the matrix was initially dense, it had far number of far more number of parameters than the chronicle product matrix the dense matrix initially had around 4 million parameters while the chronicle product matrix had around 10k parameters so during each step of gradient update the dense matrix was receiving sort of 400 times more number of gradient updates than chronicle product matrix now if you imagine a vector space where you when where one vector is receiving is is much larger in dimension and this is receiving far more gradient updates you can imagine that that vector is the one that sort of guides you to the minima. I guess, I, I don't know if that's the exact correct analogy, but that's how I view it. And that's why what happens is that the dense matrix was guiding you to a certain minima. And once the dense matrix was sparse, uh, you, you lost all that guidance, right? The, the, the values were that were pushing you to the minima were lost because of sparsity and you were not, never able to recover back. You were, you were in a crevice or a sort of curvature that was dominated by minimas that were uh, reliant on dense matrices rather than on, on in, in minimas or curvatures where the minimas were sort of uh, influenced by Kronecker product matrix. And then I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. One, one really interesting question. I'll, I left it for the last because I think it, I think it's a, an interesting topic and, 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 and whether you have an answer or, or, or any thoughts. Have you thought about the possibility of doing uh, Kronecker product decomposition essentially as a post-training step? So you train the model and then you take the, the weight matrices and then you try and break them down and, and learn chronic product matrices that factor up to that. Right, so uh, yes and no. I thought about it, I haven't really tried it. Tried it. One thing is, and um, yeah, this is where my limitations of my bad background come in from, but from, I remember, from what I remember while doing research here, there is no, uh, easy way of doing chronic product decomposition of a pre-trained neural network. So you can imagine, right? You have a weight matrix that is randomly trained and you want to do a chronic product decomposition. But chronic product decomposition has to have this very specific structure. You really cannot guarantee that you can actually in completely decompose without any loss in information, uh, a matrix into a chronic product of two smaller matrices post-training. So then you are going to see a significant difference between what the decomposition, the matrix decomposition has learned and what was originally learned. In general, for any structured matrices or for any sort of structured way of training something, as soon as you impose a fixed structure into your neural network, it is always a good idea to retrain. That's the limitation also of the structured, any, any form of structured matrices. That is the limitation of structured tuning also. You just cannot do post hoc, right? Uh, 
because now you expect a neural network to learn a minima while being aware of this fixed structure and and you are basically posting a harder constraint on your neural network and and neural networks always back propagation is very notorious it always tries to learn the simplest solution and the simplest solution will always be the one that is without a structure so doing post hoc there is always going to be extremely difficult i, I don't want to use the word impossible but extremely difficult makes sense that is why only if in, in fact doing sim something simple as svd also not does not always works right svd is a known decomposition technique for for matrices you can imagine svd being a structured version of lmf or basically it is a structured matrix version of lmf and even that does not always work in terms of neural networks okay thank you um thank you amish that was very interesting topics so uh I'm gonna launch a poll if you could uh just give me uh your thoughts on on the presentation and appreciate that. Um we obviously want to thank our sponsors, ARM, that's a strategic strategic partner. Um and uh, as you can see, they offer a range of uh different products that fit across the whole space of building tiny ML systems, but it's probably the most crucial is the CM sys. Um, layer that allows you to accelerate uh, particularly neural networks as well as many other things. Um, well, we want to thank our other sponsors, uh, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, uh, Maxim Integrated, Kixo, Reality AI and Syncense. Light uh, use uh, compression techniques to reduce the size of, of uh, networks like MobileNet to less than 200k. They will, uh, um, Deep Light will actually be speaking next week, so if you're interested in that, uh, uh, join the, the tiny ML talk there. Um, uh, AG Impulse uh, have an integrated system for gathering, training, and then testing, and then deploying uh, the tiny ML solutions to uh, uh, embedded devices. Maxim Integrated, the new Maxim AMAC, Max 78000 implements AI inferences at over 100% less energy than other embedded options. Uh, and now the edge can hear, see and hear like never before. Um, Maxim actually talked uh, last week, so if you go and look at the YouTube video, you can see their talk last week. Kixo uh, provide a wide range of ML models uh, and in their end-to-end -end system, and they can uh, train lots of models and deploy to uh, embedded devices. Reality AI have a whole uh, a tool chain, essentially, of, of building, deploying models to end devices, including the bill of materials optimization. And Syncense builds ultra-low sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. So just a reminder that next week, uh, Deep Light will be talking, Ehsan Saburi from Deep Light and Alexander Samuelson from Emojimob are, uh, so I invite you to enjoy those uh, and, and attend those uh, talks. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for attending.